Welcome. Good afternoon from a summer day in June in Washington, D.C. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance that was founded in 2003. We have a single purpose and mission. We're all about making our nation and the world a safer place through the development, the evolution and deployment of missile defenses. And since that time, and I can go all the way back to when I was a young kid, missile defense is making our world a safer place today. So today we're here to discuss the global missile defense responsibilities. We are challenged by them, by those responsibilities. We have a, a national defense strategy that's calling us to compete with our near peers. We have limited capacity and capability that are deployed today under extreme high demand across our COCOMs. We ha have gaps and we have to address those gaps in cruise missile defense, in hypersonic defense, in 360 missile defense, in layered ballistic missile defense. We have programs of records that are in play today, but they have to sustain us until the new programs come in play. We have reducing budgets, and certainly with COVID-19, we will see that pressure. We have inefficiencies, and we have the Missile Defense Review that has put forward our mission and our policy to defend against all missiles. So today's discussion is how do we make this better? How do we set the conditions to make our nation and the world safer through the deployment, the evolution and development of missile defense systems? Today, we have just, uh, I think, a phenomenal uh, group. We are represented by three combatant commands and they each have different operational environments that they work with with their missile defense mission. We have Indo-PACOM, we have NORTHCOM, and we have STRATCOM. I also, in my experience, would say that we have the two very best, most articulate, most knowledgeable, that eat and breathe missile defense here with us today. I don't think there's anybody better in the world and their knowledge and ability to communicate the issues, the technical issues, then Vice Admiral John Hill and uh, Lieutenant General Dan Carbler. In life, when you excel, you force cauldrons to happen. And out of cauldrons come greatness. Out of cauldrons come ideas, concepts, and trust. And I think we have a cauldron today with this interaction that will produce or shape and educate and advocate how we best do global missile defense and the responsibilities of that. So the program that we're gonna to do today, we'll have each of our co-coms go first and they'll present and then we'll maybe ask a question or two after their presentation. And then after the COCOMs have uh, spoken, we'll let Vice Admiral Hill, the MDA director, uh, present. And then we will open it up for Q&A uh, after that discussion. If there are any questions, please, uh, you can email to questions at missiledefenseadvocacy.org. I think we've got quite a few already that will be uh, put forward uh, at the end of the presentations. So I'm going to begin with our first uh, COCOM. Uh, I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Steve Kohler. Indo-PACOM is the biggest combatant command that the United States has. It covers all of the United States near-peer competitors and threats. It is vast in space, in water. It has the, the stability for world peace, the stability for deterrent is driven in this COCOM. 
We also are well aware of the leadership that Admiral Davidson has done to get the Indo-Pacific deterrent initiative going forward. And that has been resound uh, by both uh, Democrats and Republicans in moving forward with an authorization to create uh, support for their mission. And some of that support will go towards the missile defense mission. They're unique. They have US homeland in the order of Guam and Hawaii in their realm, as well as out front with our best allies or one of some of our greatest allies of Japan, Australia, and Korea. Admiral, uh, Rear Admiral Kohler is the director of operations. And having that size of area to operate in and having the right person uh, qualified to do that speaks for him and for his title of what he does. So I'd like to hand it off to you, Webb. And thank you for participation and thank you uh, for taking the time today. Hey, Ricky, uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, introduction. And I, you know, when you lay it all out there, now I'm now I'm like, whoa, hey, OK, that's right. I got a lot to do today. Uh, but so does everybody. And so uh, I really appreciate you bringing uh, the team, the group, the forum, all the colleagues here together uh, to discuss what you just laid out and, and all these important topics. Um, as as we all know, and certainly uh, the the colleagues on the uh, screen, and I think everybody uh, listening in, uh, Indopaycom has been structuring since 2017 uh, the changes to the national defense strategy that directed us to uh, assure the capability uh, and plan for uh, the possibility of a fight with uh, peer adversary, in this case with China. China invests heavily in air and missile defense systems, or air and missile systems, I should say, uh, to project anti-access and area denial, uh, which challenges a free and open Indo-Pacific for which we are uh, tasked and, uh, uh, and working to, uh, to uphold. The threat of air and missile attacks from an increasingly capable China should be concerning for all combatant commands uh, as they contribute to our national uh, security strategy. China represents the greatest long-term strategic threat to security in the 21st century, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but to the entire globe. The Communist Party of China is actively seeking to supplant the established rules-based order in order to dictate new international norms and behaviors and new relations uh, in the region. We see it every day and our national defense strategy recognizes it and it directs our military to retool after 20 years of counterinsurgency warfare uh, to protect against, uh, protect against existential threats and peer adversaries. We work a uh, design here in an effort called Regain the Advantage, which is designed to persuade China that any preemptive military action will be extremely costly and likely fail by projecting credible combat power at the time of crisis to provide our national leaders with several, several flexible deterrent op options to include uh, full O-Plan execution. It's based on combat credible deterrence and combat credible power forward, and it's based on four lines of effort, enhanced design and posture, strengthening of allies and partners, exercises, experimentation and innovation, and increased joint lethality. Through these lines of effort, uh, we must field and sustain a joint force that is postured to win before fighting, and if necessary, be ready to fight and win. So I'll talk specifically about two of those lines of effort here. Uh, one is joint lethality, uh, to retool our military to support regional conflict against peer adversaries, we must increase joint and combined force lethality. Our investments must harness the advanced capabilities provided by a network of leading edge technologies such as integrated air and missile defenses, long range precision fires, joint and coalition command and control networks and resilient logistics and sustainment networks and suppliers. Our allies and partners uh, must be relied upon as these uh, capabilities cannot be US only solutions. We work hand in hand with regional partners to include Australia, uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea as uh, Ricky mentioned 
to ensure our advanced capabilities, support and integrate with allies and partners uh, to ensure a uh, credible combined fight. Air and missile defense is a leading area for partner integration with Australia, Japan and Korea as mentioned, all of which own Aegis systems uh, with regular rehearsals for employing these systems together. As uh, Ricky mentioned, Indo-PACOM is the biggest and bluest of our military geographic commands uh, and our area of responsibility is vast. So we can't help but start with missile defense conversations uh, here in Aegis. But the robust peer fight will, will require we bring the best of what all the services have to offer, integrated together at the machine level in a way that we have not needed in the past. For us, our Pathfinder event uh, is the Homeland Defense of Guam. It's the most important action we can take to increase the lethality of joint force and fully implement the NDS, and that's to introduce a 360 degree persistent air and missile defense capability on Guam. It's more than just homeland to Indo-PACOM, it's a critical, critical nexus for command and control, logistics, and power projection. We like to comment here in Indo-PACOM that not only do we have to fight from Guam, but its importance requires us to fight for Guam. By integrating together the best of, of each service's programs of record under one battle management system, we can close gaps and provide defense against a mix of advanced air and missile threats. And as I mentioned, it's a pathfinder event for joint employment. That integration capability will extend forward to support maneuvering forces, be they Army, Air Force, Navy, or Marine elements, to bust uh, anti or A2AD bubbles and to allow our forces to project joint lethality. It's all within near term reach and working with MDA, uh, we aren't starting from scratch, but simply tying together the best of each of the services, current and future programs to create a joint effect of any sensor, best shooter. China is the most challenging requirement for missile defense, but not the only requirement. As Fumez uh, here from uh, Northcom, uh, uh, it's great to have him here uh, to discuss the responsibilities in these these uh, this conversation. Indo-PACOM has supported Northcom's ballistic missile defense of the homeland against rogue threats for quite a while. The requirement to defend America, including Hawaii, where I sit today, against rogue threats does not go away. So we must find those synergies that uh, where we and where we are and where the architecture is capable of supporting regional conflict against those advanced threats uh, for homeland defense against the uh, what is ultimately somewhat simpler, though not, not simple, uh, rogue threats. Finally, we must continue to refine command and control to ensure we are ready to make fast decisions necessary to win against highly capable, advanced adversaries bent on interrupting our decision cycles. While China is a global actor, conflict will most likely occur regionally below the threshold of our strategic nuclear deterrence. If our 70 year track record uh, against Russia is indi indicator, this this will come to pass. So while we cannot pursue efficiencies, so, so not not, excuse me. So while we can pursue and should pursue efficiencies in acquisition and modernization in support of global forces, we must preserve the ability to max employ those forces regionally to enable joint force lethality against a highly capable adversary. So uh, a long intro, Ricky, uh, hopefully not too yeah, long. I, uh, I appreciate you bringing us together. Um, for us, you know, combat credible forces forward to enable the fight when needed. And the hope out of Indo-PACOM is to uh, win before fighting. But I'll tell you, uh, the intent is be ready to fight and win. So when the fight comes, we're ready to take it to the enemy. And with that, I'll uh, yield the floor to my colleagues and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Admiral. Um, just for the for the audience, um, Guam might have maybe the best ballistic missile defense layered uh, for the population that they protect with both the Aegis capability and the FAD capability that is deployed there. It seems like it would also be the leading edge because you are the most Western part of our country versus China to set the deterrent. You have offensive capability strategic on that island as well. And to build that out would set the example to the other COCOMs possibly, and to our allies, obviously, to support that architecture or support that capability to get you that deterrent 
that, that you that you request. And it looks from an outsider that that the 360 over the horizon persistent um, capabilities is pretty is really um, warranted in that position, unlike any position possibly CENTCOM, but that, that right there and solving that problem uh, with the integrated air and missile defense in addition to the capabilities that are there, um, it seems like this is the perfect place to lead uh, the world in this kind of uh, vision that, that I think the global missile defense responsibilities are heading towards. That wasn't a question. I, I just I wanted to just throw that out there. I know John's going to get a chance to answer it, but I just wanted to get your perspective on on how powerful that could be. Yeah, Ricky. Uh, first of all, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're in violent agreement there. I mean, I would tell you that from a from a node from which we need to project power, we do project power, um, and the ability to sustain then the fight should it come. Um, the defense there is is critical, and as you as you said. Um, there is a very strong capability here to um, be to be very deterrent in our capability and capacity forward, um, where uh, it is it is then able to um, uh, well or to be the enabler for uh, for combat power to continue to move forward. So in that case, the protection uh, and uh, needs thereof are uh, are where we get to the 360 degree requirement to handle the advanced threats that uh, uh, that are on the horizon um, certainly and uh, here presently now and so um, completely agree with you I think it's an opportunity to um, uh, build out what uh, all of us in uh, combat commands are looking for and this is a a way to um, really show how this can be integrated by the services. Uh, I think we have to take all the efficiencies of all of that. It's a very unique environment. You know, it's a fixed base, um, you know, U.S. Army missile defense capability, then with a maritime aspect that is movement. And um, all of those things have to be integrated to handle this defense um, and enable this, uh, this posture uh, forward. So, um, so agree with you wholeheartedly. And I look forward to John's position because I think that the expense of having that uh, Navy ship out in front and rather getting that on land is would save a lot of efficiencies uh, in cost for you and to allow that to have another platform that you can use elsewhere is, is also, I think, uh, fits well. Okay, go ahead. I would just comment that uh, that agree. You know, the the fixing a uh, fixing a maneuverable force uh, for the defense of a fixed object is uh, is not as efficient um, when we have uh, a strong threat throughout the theater. So the ability to uh, move shipping and Aegis capability for the defense of the maneuver pieces that are are then forward, I think, is really important. Um, and uh, and this fight will be. Uh, an all-encompassing one where we're going to require all of that. So, um, so pulling uh, ships off fixed site defense to enable then uh, defense or uh, Aegis capability of forward maneuver forces, I think is key. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. Our, our next presenter, and I think for the American public, is the most important COCOM in the world, which is the U.S. homeland of NORTHCOM, and every citizen uh, would want to have this area of responsibility of yours completely uh, defended against everything, but certainly against the threats that we face today with North Korea um, and, and as we expand out. So this is a, it's an honor to have you here, Major General uh, Kevin Hyde, to uh, as the head of operations for NORTHCOM. And uh, you, you've got some great things coming. You've got the, the newest generation NGI that's going to come up there to, to better serve your the country and its ability to defend it from BMD. But there does seem to be some gaps here with cruise missile defense uh, up top on the Arctic. And I think there was a great document that was put out yesterday by DOD on the underlayer that was just brought the concept in there to give you more depth. And it's also great to see that because you have 
uh, existing capability in his ship, so he may not want the ships to be used that way, but the ships are there with platforms, and so is that once those weapon systems are, are proven to do what they need to do. So you have, you, there is some good stuff here in NORTHCOM to, to integrate, and I think you, there's some similarity between you and Indo-PACOM on the cruise missile architecture, how you guys uh, figure that out. But uh, it's, it's an honor to have you. I know uh, I've had some time with uh, with uh, Gumas over at uh, in Europe. We did the European Defender of the Year together, and uh, we also did uh, the, the Dutch Defender of the Year together. So I, I appreciate your support for the Allies. You understand that intricate uh, teamwork that's that's required. So it's all yours. Well, Ricky, thanks, and uh, it is a true honor as the new Director of Operations for uh, for Northern Command. And, uh, and I'm mindful that there's two patches behind me. Uh, the Shared Command under General O'Shaughnessy is also a NARAD, North American Aerospace Defense uh, Command. And as we look at ballistic missile defense and cruise missile defense, it's very clear that there's a nexus overall to the homeland defense. And again, thanks to the uh, my co-panelists and really MDA as we bring this together and as we talk about responsibilities, uh, you know, NORTHCOM and the responsibility to defend the homeland against ballistic missile threats cannot be cannot be uh, understated or overstated. It, it just has to be coming in very loud. We have a sacred responsibility and we're on the watch 24-7 and we can't do it without the partnership of uh, my colleagues and the seniors here uh, you know, on the, uh, uh, on the VTC. And Rick, you asked, how do we make it better? I think the way we make it better is to talk about it, to see how we transform the way we think about homeland defense, and most importantly, how we think about cruise missile defense and ballistic missile defense and advanced capabilities that I know we'll have a chance to uh, discuss a little bit uh, further. And uh, it's always on my mind, missile defense, and really great comments. Uh, thanks, Webb, from Indo-PACOM. Uh, I couldn't, uh, couldn't footstomp more the idea about a 360 defense. And as you sit here in the homeland, you realize every direction you look has unique geography. It has a very uh, unique approach. And most importantly, we know that threats can come from that 360 uh, in all areas. And being mindful of that, we know that as we transform the way we think about homeland defense and we look at how we get advocacy and advanced capabilities, um, it's real great to see the discussion about layer defense. And I'll go into that just a little bit here. Um, missile defense is so relevant and hard at the heart of our sacred responsibility. We can't do it without our without our key partners to execute the mission. So I want to say thanks, first of all, to the teammates on the uh, on the screen. But it's that incredibly complex and uh, increasingly complex security environment that really makes me appreciate how we approach this forum. Uh, we're not resting on our laurels. It's through advancements in technology, continual testing, and then looking at how we bring in new advances in the systems that we currently have, and then an eye to the future, as you talked about, the advances in a next generation uh, interceptor uh, for the future. But the one thing I'll leave everyone with is that failure is really not an option. We've heard a lot of that before, but uh, as we're intently focused on the mission, I see that as the threats continue to evolve, we too have to evolve to maintain our technical and our military advantages. As General Taylor mentioned, but we need to be mindful of what this does to our overall architecture and the need to improve. We talk about the sensors, we talk about the shooter or the way to get the intercept. And then I'll cover a little bit on the uh, command and control piece and I look forward to having more conversations about that. But I'll, uh, I'll highlight, you know, it's a team sport. And that's why all of us are on the screen here from setting requirements to development and then working the responsibilities across the combatant commands and bringing in that warfighter uh, that warfighter concept because we each look at the world slightly differently but we all have the same aim and it's homeland defense it's the forward defense the power projection uh, and how that nests in overall and uh, being uh, in the discussion with Indo-PACOM with a uh, strategic command and the missile defense agency really highlights those responsibilities are shared across uh, all of us and I know the layer defense which you mentioned which is uh, which has taken some press recently really makes us optimistic about the opportunity to look at new sensors 
uh, new potential kill mechanisms, new shooter, if you will. And as was mentioned with the Aegis on Guam, or as we look at homeland defense here in the, in the continental United States, what's in Hawaii and Alaska, how do we integrate all of those sensors for a way forward to be more effective? Because we know the missile threats today require that integration. We have to have a way to sense them, to continually track and discriminate them. And most importantly, is that to make sure we don't get to an end game where we have a challenge and intercept from there. So it's having the awareness of those threats, which could come from many different regions or even under the sea, uh, reminds us that um, we need to keep overall situational awareness. And in here at Northern Command and uh, our co-command with uh, NORAD, we know that using uh, sensors that are out there already um, to feed into a common system really help in our homeland defense design and it also enhance our ballistic missile defense. And we see the use of Aegis and we see the use of THAAD and that layered defense really gives us an opportunity as we move towards the future to use what we have that's proven and develop that overall layered capability. So as we modernize this homeland defense layer here in a Northern Command, there's a few areas that we're keenly focused on. One is enhancing that domain awareness. And our commander is really clear that if we have good awareness of where the threats are coming from, uh, any potential attack or threats to our homeland, and we're able to connect the shooter to complete an intercept and defend, that's huge success. But it's all about the command and control infrastructure and architecture that really makes it glue together. And that was mentioned by NOPACOM. I'm sure the other panelists will highlight for that. And then we have continue to push the requirements of what it looks like for a future defensive capability. And we're real, uh, have a real promising look to the future and the advancement of uh, when the NGI will, uh, will come into play. And it's these key elements approach, how we look at it as an entire ecosystem. And I key in on that word because an ecosystem lives and breathes with all the other pieces and parts and partnership that, that flow into that. And we have everybody represented here today, which is really, really important. Um, so as it was just noted, that warfighter perspective leans us into thinking how we transform the way we look at homeland defense, ballistic missile defense and cruise missile defense. And we're, uh, we're seeking new ways to enhance and shape those capabilities based on how we layer the defense and how we use advances in the technology. Um, one of your previous forums, you talked about the space layer. And I'd be remiss to say that, uh, you know, as we look at Space Command as a great partner as well, and how we can leverage that space layer for sensing, ballistic missile tracking, and even the future developing hypersonic capabilities with the uh, hypersonic glide vehicles. We know as that enters the discussion, it becomes even more important again as we build this ecosystem together. And a, a global network of sensors would really help provide uh, very good situational awareness from a launch all the way through intercept and then we blend in all the other sensors that we're talking about with advanced capabilities and i'll leave you with the concept that we have and it's continuing to evolve as an ongoing concept but it's our shield it's easy to say shield but it stands for the strategic homeland integrated ecosystem for layered defense and every one of those words really fits nicely together but the layered defense piece and the integrated ecosystem blend together when we talk about the cruise missile defense dynamics and the uh, and homeland defense and the ballistic missile defense uh, uh, all in one. And as, uh, as General Kaler mentioned, the really the big wrap on that is the command and control. How do we sense the environment to maintain that all, the, all domain awareness and how do we actually work the control uh, piece of it as well to be effective in defense? And as I said, it's an ongoing development. Um, we look at what the architecture we can build out in the future, but this goes to the transformation that uh, that our commander has us looking at in NORTHCOM and also in NORAD, but really it's the joint all domain command and control blending in this sensor grid that's layered with the defense for our homeland. And we can't forget the partnerships that we have with strategic command with Indo-PACOM and the other combatant commands that are out there to blend in, to defeat mechanisms and to, uh, and to be more effective in the entire laydown. And I know the architecture, the infrastructure and how systems talk together at the machine level to speed decision and share data is extremely important. And I look forward to any questions that, uh, that we have on SHIELD or how NORTHCOM integrates across with the, uh, the future developments. And uh, back over to you, Ricky. Thanks for the opportunity to open up. Thank you, Fumaz. That was awesome. Um, really appreciate you bringing together the space 
perspective of it and being able to to work that discrimination with what HPTSS is to be able to get the lower the shock doctrine on those layer defense capabilities. What what I'm interested, what we're interested in is where where do you and Indo-PACOM come together on the architect where it's the same thing that you guys are benefiting from because we don't have enough money, I don't think, to fund both Indo-PACOM and NORTHCOM for, for doing separate architectures. We just don't have it. It seems like Indo-PACOM today is going to get momentum and get movement because of what what the Rear Admiral uh, Kohler had stated and how important that, that position is for them. So is there is there architect that we can share together that would be beneficial in NORTHCOM from what Indo-PACOM could do or would do? I appreciate that, Ricky. It's a really good leading question. And I know uh, from uh, from Webb and I, we have a lot of these discussions as well. Um, I'll, I'll take back to one of the uh, initial comments I said, which is the uh, which is the aim to have, you know, an integration across the combatant commands to understand our tactics, techniques and procedures and the communications that we share from there. And I will say, based on some of the Pathfinder efforts that he's working in, and most importantly, some of the lessons that he's learning, I think will really inform um, where we are as we look to build out and continue to modernize the homeland defense piece in a continental United States and even up in Alaska from there. So there's a shared responsibility uh, from there. You know, the programmatics and what the overall architecture will look like for the future. Uh, I have to say when you're on a team, the best part is to understand what your objective is and then continually work towards that. So as we share the responsibilities and we look how the architecture lays out, we see where the funding goes. Um, and most importantly, we get the lessons learned from that. I think we might find in the future as we continue to transform the way we think about homeland defense, ballistic missile and cruise missile defense, we can learn a lot of lessons from that. And yes, there's a programmatic layer, but really I think as we look to uh, the decisions that are made, uh, Northern Command definitely supports anything that benefits our homeland defense overall. And I think that's the right way to look at it because, uh, you know, the teammates that we have here know, like you said, there are, uh, uh, you know, there are fiscal responsibilities to be managed and there is an architecture to continue to build out. And I think we might find there's some economies overall uh, to get after the, uh, the end state, which is that missile defense. Thank Over. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fumas. That was great. Um, our next speaker is uh, Lieutenant General Dan Carbler, um, and he is this, the uh, JIFIC IMD, uh, Integrated Air Missile Defense uh, Component Command for STRATCOM. He's also, it's also great to have an Army perspective coming from him. He is the highest ranked Army uh, General on Air and Missile Defense, the head of the, the uh, Space Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Dan has done everything uh, with missile defense on the Army. He's done the testing evaluation. He's done the 94th. He's done the 32nd. He's done the schoolhouse. He's been in the Indo-PACOM arena. He's been here in the United States. He knows the issue very, very well with the, uh, with the tools that he's been around and integrated. But what also is pretty important to note is that Dan was the, uh, the um, chief of staff under the former uh, STRATCOM commander, John Hyten. And John Hyten and Dan had to submit into the MDR the global responsibilities for missile defense or, or start to look at that and, and influence and shape that. So it's kind of great to get him on board here and hear what he has to say as a STRATCOM co uh, component commander and also possibly as the Army, because I know the convergence issues and, and so forth and, and, we're, and his perspective would be wonderful. And congratulations on your daughter, Lauren, from graduating from West Point, Dan. That's awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ricky. And uh, I don't know if I set a good example for her, but she'll be an air defender too. So everything that uh, that we're working at is making sure that the that the generation of the class of 2020 gets the best air and missile defense capabilities to keep everybody safe. Um, but uh, hey, I appreciate you inviting me to, uh, to be on the Global Missile Defense Responsibilities Forum today. It's, it's really an honor. Um, it's great to be here with uh, with Webb and Kevin and my good friend uh, John Hill from the Missile Defense Agency. I don't know, John, if this will count for our uh, every other week uh, touched up or not, but we'll we'll take uh, take credit for it. Um, you know, because it is about relationships as we're as we're into global missile defense responsibilities and how you build on those relationships, um, how you interact, the frequency of them, 
uh, it, it can't just be a pickup game. And uh, in the missile defense arena, because the uh, the community is pretty well knit, um, I feel pretty confident that it's never a pickup game. Um, I took over Space and Missile Defense Command about seven months ago. Seems like a COVID environment, a COVID uh, whole time frame ago, but but seven months ago, you know, when I took command, I said in my 32 years of being in the Army, never had I seen Space and Missile Defense Command more relevant than it was then, and, and that that holds true for today. Um, when I look at the global missile defense responsibilities, I got to uh, just you know share a little bit with with what my responsibilities are and how they play into that. So as you mentioned, Ricky, so yep, I'm uh, the Joint Force Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense, uh, our Strat Army Strategic Command. So I work for uh, now Admiral Richard. And you're right, coming out of uh, Stratcom for almost three years as the Chief of Staff, where Admiral Richard was the Deputy and General Hyden uh, was the Commander. And then as we went through the, the MDR, invaluable experience, uh, both being able to participate in the MDR, but also just learning from those two great leaders, General Hyden and, and Admiral Richard. So, so I work for STRATCOM, but I'm also the Army Service component to Space Command. So I'm the R Space. So General Raymond turns to me for all Army space capabilities. Um, and that, that's important too, because we, we've got to integrate our space <laughs> capabilities into the <laughs> defense mission talked about it a, a little bit before. Um, I'm also the supporting commander to NORTHCOM. We provide uh, the 100th GMD Brigade that provides us with our uh, homeland missile defense. We like to say it's 300, defending 300 million, but we provide those forces and then NORTHCOM has the operational control of those forces, again, to keep our, to keep our homeland protected. And then lastly, I am the uh, Army's Air and Missile Defense Enterprise Integrator. So I just gonna affect you just a little bit because if he's watching, he'll he'll send you an email. But Jim Dickinson is really the senior <laughs> Army Air Defender. Uh, the but I'm position. the senior yeah. I'm, I'm the senior I'm the senior Army Air Defender in an Army position right now. But as the uh, AMD uh, Enterprise Integrator, I report directly to the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army on all those Army specific air and missile defense issues that come up and that can be from from our forces to our modernization where we work with the uh, cross functional teams to unit readiness to training exercises etc uh, they they all they all kind of funnel up to me uh, obviously with a lot of help from from different folks out there fire center of excellence the cfts uh, the double amdc's etc uh, to be able to provide a common operations picture to the uh, army senior leaders so let me double back a little bit since i just kind of laid out the four big hats that I wear. So uh, so I just want to touch on each one of them I could, if I could uh, a little bit. So in, in STRATCOM, uh, you'll hear Admiral Richard talk a lot about the risk of strategic deterrence failure. And a lot of times when we think about STRATCOM, we only think about nuclear operations. We think about the triad with STRATCOM. Well, strategic deterrence has two elements, well, has three elements. Uh, two of the main ones are impose unacceptable cost and deny benefit. Missile defense plays the major role in denying benefit. So my interface with STRATCOM is to make sure that those missile defense forces are there and available, whether regionally or globally, to provide, to, to make sure that we're denying uh, adversary benefit. And that, that's, that's super important as we look at um, where we have capabilities around the globe to make sure that they are there uh, equally dispersed to the combat commands to support their mission needs so that the adversaries uh, don't feel that they could take advantage of a, uh, of a lesser missile defense capability in a, in a particular region. And, and every week we are assessing our risk of strategic deterrence failure and providing that assessment to, to Admiral Richard. Um, also in my uh, RSTRAT uh, hat, I support the strategic command in the OFSC which is really the requirements uh, uh, governing body that we have that, that uh, enables all the combat commands, uh, STRATCOM, as well as the uh, Missile Defense Agency to talk about the requirements and, and make sure that we're all of one accord or as close to one accord as we can be as we, as we talk about uh, operational issues and push requirements up uh, to uh, the Missile Defense Agency. We also, I also support STRATCOM and the Missile Defense uh, Executive Board, the MDEB, um, again, to make sure that uh, we understand the requirements that are going up and then understand where the Missile Defense Agency is with respect to its acquisition approaches 
and, uh, and, and where, it's, uh, where it's heading to. So those are some of the missile defense government pieces and, and uh, uh, my touch points uh, within uh, strategic command. Now let me shift focus just a, a little bit to, uh, to space command in my role with, uh, a, as the Army space component for space command and working for General Raymond. And it, it is fortuitous because uh, Jim Dickinson is the deputy commander at Space Command. So we really do have a, a really solid missile defense uh, foundation with the Space Command. And it is important because um, as, as, we, as we explore hypersonics and we explore the threats, you've got to be able to see it first. You've got to be able to see it before you can shoot it. And our HBTSS and our, our space uh, sensing layer has got to be able to, to look at and, and see those threats uh, as they come out. And not just because we need to be able to shoot them, but we need to be able to have attribution, which adversary launched them, so that we can counter we can counter that. Um, General Raymond has got the responsibilities for the global sensor manager and his uh, unified command plan responsibilities. Stratcom, this is where the bridge happens. Stratcom owns Tippy Two radars. They're the they're the COCOM for the Tippy Two radars. Um, we've got them out in uh, Indo PACOM. We have them in CENTCOM and and UCOM. So they're across the uh, uh, three of the geographic commanders. Those TP2 radars, in addition to their missile defense mission, also provide General Raymond with some space domain awareness capability. So the nexus within, within, uh, within what I do from uh, STRATCOM and SPACECOM, we're able to provide uh, the operational and the situational awareness to both General Raymond and Admiral Richard for those TP2 radars. And again, it's, it's pretty unique, and, 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 um, and I really enjoy having a requirement to be able to um, to track what the TP2 radars are doing operationally, again from the missile defense perspective and from the uh, from the space domain awareness perspective. Um, with respect to Northcom, the 100th GMD and the 49th uh, GMD battalion up at uh, Fort Greeley, uh, we have a great relationship uh, with uh, with that brigade and providing that to Northern Command. Uh, we do the organized train and equip, so training, the exercises, the certifications of all those crews, uh, Space and Missile Defense Command does, and then we provide that ready force to Northern Command for their operational control. So they have them They have them 24-7. Beak, it's a National Guard unit. It's a Colorado National Guard that provides those forces. Uh, they, are, they are in National Guard status until they're on mission, and then they're, they're in the Title 10 status. So it's a very unique organization uh, that we have. Uh, but it works great again with the with the superb help of uh, Northern Command. And then lastly, as the uh, Army's uh, Air Missile Defense Enterprise Integrator, so that gives me the distinct view of the AMD forces and capabilities. As I said uh, earlier, I give that uh, advice and recommendations to the Sec Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army. So if there's an air defense issue that comes up, um, I'm pretty much on speed dial back to the Chief or the Vice or the or the Sec Army for an issue. Um, some of the big issues that are up right now, uh, Patriot Op Tempo. As we know, the Patriot Force is probably one of the most highly deployed, forward stationed, conventional forces in the Army. Um, they're over in CENTCOM right now, uh, doing a great job over there. Um, and there's just a huge demand on the Army's uh, Patriot Forces. One of the things that, uh, that I like to say, though, is people keep clamoring for more and more air defense is we can't Patriot our way out of this. Um, I, th I can't remember if uh, if Webb said it, but or uh, or Kevin said it, but uh, AMD is a team sport, and so we can't just always rely on the Army Air Missile Defense Forces to provide capabilities. It really does have to be a joint effort. If I could if I could use a really bad analogy, John Hill's a technology guy, so he's probably gonna gonna hate me for it. But if you remember the old graphic equalizer days. Ricky, you probably still have one in your family room. Remember the old graphic equalizers and they had the toggle switch of treble and bass and left speaker and right speaker and front and back and, and everything. Because and at the end, you always, you always wanted to play your, uh, your wonderful uh, uh, eight tracks, Ricky. You always want to have the best music coming out the back end. Well, I kind of look at, uh, I look at integrated air missile defense as that graphic equalizer. We want good IMD music coming out the back end. But unfortunately right now, uh, from the Army perspective is the toggle switches, we take active defense, Army active defense toggle switch, and that thing is thrown all the way to the top. Pass defense, attack ops, uh, coalition uh, and, and allies contributions, um, space contributions, cyber, 
those are all not quite thrown up as high as, as they could be, should be as we look at this as, again, as a team sport. So what we're always trying to do is make sure that we take and toggle those switches, <clears throat> got good capability, and, and they're all set just about right so that we don't throw our forces off balance uh, because globally, if we're unbalanced in one area, um, then the, the, uh, the other geographic combat commanders could be without capability. Um, so that's what I want to leave you with, Ricky. Again, uh, I, I uh, <clears throat> really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak in the forum here. It's, it's uh, my great honor to be able to command uh, the uh, soldiers and civilians of uh, Space and Missile Defense Command, as well as the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines of uh, JIFIC IMD. So subject to any questions or comments, thanks, Ricky. Yeah, Th thanks, Dan. Great, great analogy, way to, way to be able to picture that team through a, a stereo system is great. Um, I do want to ask, uh, because of the myriad of uh, commands that you advise, have we changed anything on global responsibilities? Are you comfortable with you and uh, General Hyten? We're looking at maybe readdressing some of these responsibilities to become more efficient. It looks like we're still doing the same things. And is that, are the COCOMs okay with that? Or, or can we be better with that? Or do we need more capacity? Or do we need more, better policy? Do we need, how do we make this more efficient? Because it, uh, there's a lot there that you threw out that doesn't seem to be that efficient uh, as, a, as a full go thing uh, on it. And, and it may have worked, you know, 10 years ago, but as we get into a, a pretty high near peer competitor, we'll, we'll, this it looks too big to, to handle there a little bit. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. It's very topical. Um, as a, you know, principle of unity of command is really important. And in missile defense, uh, we do have to do a better job of unity of command. Um, and I know the CAT commanders are working um, in their uh, dialogues uh, with the Secretary of Defense with respect to their missile defense missions. Uh, we're working on that, and uh, there'll be more to follow. But that's really a lot of the uh, a lot of the follow up after uh, uh, the MDR came out because it was it was getting exactly after what uh, General Hyten and, and we were seeking coming out of the MDR. Okay. Well, thank you. And it, it's, it's got to be tough because when you have those limited capacities of Patriots and Thaz and you move them, then the, the other side takes advantage of when they move them out. So it's it's difficult to, to deal with that. And I'm sure getting the newer technology, the cheaper technology, the more efficient uh, capabilities in the field quicker so we can relieve some of that pain um, on that. Because I don't know if we have the funding to increase that capacity that much. It's more about getting what, what John Hill is, is in charge of is developing more, more sleek, efficient uh, technologies that are going to help, help everything to be able to do that. But really appreciate it. Thank no, you. And, 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 uh, um, but again, you bring up another a good point is, uh, you know, so the Army's invested $24 billion over um, into air and missile defense capabilities. So as you look at uh, IBCS that's coming online here, and that test is going to start here uh, very shortly, yeah. that's going to really help us out in the efficiencies um, as we uh, as we look at bringing in IFIC and other capabilities to help us with the bring back uh, our short range air defense capabilities, uh, counter UAS capabilities. The Army has significantly invested uh, uh, into those capabilities as well. So if, in addition to Patriot and Thad, and yes, I, I think we all recognize that there's a capacity challenge there. But some of the uh, some of the programs we have coming online include uh, LTAMs too. Some of these programs that we have coming online are really really going to help us out in the mission set. And, and as you saw that underlayer, Dan, it looks like that. I mean, not looks. That's part of that underlayer. So those things could be also taken for Northcom's role if they ever needed that as an underlayer. So it even puts more pressure on on your ability with limited uh, capability. Is, it, is that an issue or is that something you got to manage again with um, with your hats? Yeah, I just don't have a good answer for you right now, Ricky, just because of the, uh, you know, the, the nascent capability of it. And plus, uh, OSD CAPE is going to do a AOA. They're going to do a study of it right now. We'll contribute to that to make sure that uh, whatever capabilities are needed for the underlayer, um, should that be one of them, we'll be sure to uh, uh, inform that decision. Okay. Th thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Okay, we, we've got probably the hardest job of them all <laughs> is Vice Admiral Hill, who is the chief architect of everything and has to, you know, he's got a limited budget. 
He's got to do R&D and he's got to make all the co-coms and their specific requirements uh, the best he can with what he's got. So he is uh, he, he's known he's where he's at with three stars for his ability to integrate systems. That's what he's great at. He's done it from very young all the way up. Um, and he's got a very unique ability to do that. And he's at the right place at the right time. So I'd like to introduce to everybody the director of the Missile Defense Agency, John Hill. Hey, yeah. good, good afternoon, everybody. And hello, Ricky. Thank you. I, I know there's a Mr. Rude uh, kind of hiding in the background there, but uh, good, good afternoon, uh, sir. It's very great to not see you. Um, <laughs> hey, I'd like to welcome uh, Fumaz aboard. Uh, it's great. It's going to be great partnering with you. Uh, thank, thanks for what you're already doing there at uh, NORAD and NORTHCOM. Uh, always great to see my my good friend uh, Webb Kaler. Um, you know, since we've been grounded from traveling, I, I haven't had the opportunity to be out in Indo Paycom, sitting in your office and strategizing uh, about the future. Uh, and of course, my uh, my partner uh, Dan Cargler there, and we we really do get together often and talk about stereos and our favorite uh, you know classic rock bands. Uh, so it is uh, great great to be here with everyone to discuss a very important topic. You know, uh, we, we talk a lot about the uh, Missile Defense Agency's mission and the mission to me, I always tell my folks it's a, it's a noble mission because, you know, fundamentally it is about just protecting uh, this country. It is uh, about layered defense. Uh, it actually says that in the mission statement that has been around for a long time. I think it stands the test of time. Layered defense to protect uh, the country or deployed forces and our allies and then across all phases of flight. So it's got some visionary uh, aspects about it. Um, and uh, Dan already talked about uh, how uh, defense uh, is part of deterrence. Uh, it really is. And so the uh, first time I met with uh, Admiral Richard and we reported up to uh, STRATCOM, uh, we talked about the importance of that and how uh, it, it is a priority for STRATCOM. I'm going to swing back around to, to that in just a second. Uh, when you look at the priorities of the Missile Defense Agency, it's not just uh, for the convenience of how we bucketize uh, the, the limited funding that, that we do have. But it, it really kind of speaks to not only my people, but to the external audience. When I say priority one is to support the warfighter, I mean that. And I will tell you, uh, having these gentlemen on the line with me today, I work for them. My team works for the combatant commands. They are how we define the warfighter. So that is priority one. And if you look at our budget, we take a lot of heat for this. It is where the majority of our budget goes is into that sustainment support so that the service can operate and sustain whatever in whatever geographic uh, capacity they happen to be in uh, number one priority and oh by the way despite COVID-19 we never missed a beat on ensuring that we were standing behind that priority priority number two is a tough one that is the capability and capacity you know building out for structure upgrading ships you know working on the next uh, thad battery working on the next upgrade to, to sm3 uh, very important and i would say at the core and the heart of what the agency does is to develop and deploy new capabilities that can be used uh, globally by our warfighters represented uh, here today by, by these uh, great gentlemen. And then finally, the third one is the advancing threat. And we've, we've kind of picked on it a little bit in this conversation today. Uh, I remain concerned about my bread and butter, which is ballistic missile defense, because it has not gone away despite the quietness that we might be getting from uh, some areas that were pretty active just a couple years ago. Those threats are advancing, they're becoming more complex, and we've got to address them. And so we talked about the space layer earlier. Uh, that's an important part of dealing with uh, some of the capabilities that are coming forward in, in these ballistic missiles. I tell you, strategic cruise missiles, that is a real threat. And so we got to get after that. And then what we've already seen demonstrated and we see demonstrated on a regular basis are these hypersonic threats, which come at you either ballistically launched, they're dropped from aircraft, and they come as cruise missiles. So from the uh, the sailor standing on the deck or the soldier by the battery, they all look the same. They are maneuvering and they're going very, very fast. And so we've got some big challenges uh, for us as we face the future. And again, the threat's going to drive all that. What works for us is how we're chartered. How are our requirements? How do they come to us? You know, so when Ricky uh, poses the question about potential conflict between uh, uh, the different command and commands, how do we define layer defense? Is there some subtlety there? To me, there is no light. Uh, our requirements are consolidated by strategic command. STRATCOM owns that process. Dan talked about the Operational Forces Standing Committee. That has its heritage with the JROC. It is a direct flow down uh, from the JROC, and it, uh, it is headed out uh, by, by STRATCOM. So Missile Defense and the Missile Defense Agency relies on that Operational Forces Standing Committee with representatives from all the combatant commands and JIFIC IMB consolidating those requirements because the last thing you want me to do as an acquisition organization is de-conflicting requirements. 
that is not what we should do. And so the process is in place for STRATCOM to consolidate those. And so whether those requirements in that process stay at STRATCOM or if they shift someplace else, it's got to stay together because as soon as you unconsolidate, it's going to become chaos. So I'm able to build a palm brief. I'm able to roll right through the process and deliver capabilities today because I know where my requirements come from. And that's just absolutely critical. So with that, Ricky, uh, thanks thanks for the opportunity uh, to chit chat. I guess uh, we'll roll it back to you for question yep. and answer. Thanks. Thanks, John. You you, um, you brought in the, the cruise missile defense element. How What's the best way to do this? Is it, uh, for you to have the funding or support because you, you're maxed out. So where, is that new funding or is it, how do we get that mission somehow un, under your arms with your architect? I know there's some charter that you're the executive agent for cruise missile defense, but is that, what's this, you know, how do we do this? Or do we leave it the way it is with separate services doing their own cruise missile defense capabilities? Well, well, I would, uh, and you kind of touched on a little bit there, Ricky, right? We, we, do, we do nothing by ourselves, right? Uh, all the capabilities that we can talk about and attribute to the Missile Defense Agency are typically tied to a service, and they're in the execution mode, and they're operating and sustaining the, the, those uh, different capabilities that are out there. I view cruise missiles, uh, you know, and that a very lethal threat uh, to the homeland as sort of in that same world to where we should not have a scarcity mentality. We shouldn't go look at the MDA budget and say, oh, well, we've got ballistic missile defense, we have cruise missile defense, we have hypersonic defense. Therefore, let's just divide the, the budget in three ways. That is not how the enemy thinks. That is not what the adversary is going to throw at us, right? So the nation needs to take a hard look at that threat. And as uh, uh, General uh, Carper said, th there's an AOA going on right now to take a look at specific threats that will drive us into the investment streams that we make. And if the country decides that they're going to spend more, I say spend more. But to sit there and say that we're going to divide up the existing budget that we have and have a scarcity mentality is just dangerous for the country. No, so. Absolutely agree. Thank, thank you, John. I'm now going to turn it over to uh, my new uh, board member, uh, the former Undersecretary John Rood, to uh, start off his questions uh, and uh, reflect the questions from the audience. So, John, it's all yours. Well, it's great to be with all the panelists here remotely. We got quite a few questions, uh, several pages that have been sent in from different people listening. So I'll, I'll ask some questions and try to summarize some of those questions to the various panelists. Um, but the purpose of today's uh, webcast, of course, was talking about global missile defense responsibilities. And I thought a Dan, Lieutenant General Karbler talked about the fact that different COCOMs are, are looking at that and that there's some examination of that. General Carbler, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that about as you look across that from your perch as JIFIC IMD commander and somebody with STRATCOM as the role of the synchronizer of operational capabilities across the joint force, where do you see the major issues and the things that need to be improved? What isn't working as well as it should to be you know, much more efficient? Uh, of course, these systems are working well today. They were put in place though some years ago and the threat is, is closing the timelines that we have to work with. So General Carver, could you just talk about some of the areas for improvement? Sure, I think, you know, so at the regional level, um, the air missile defense fight is, if you would, under the geographics, it, it, is, it is done very, very well. And, and I have my experience out in both uh, the 94th WMDC where I worked very closely with then uh, General Carlisle as the PACAF commander. And then I was also fortunate enough to be uh, deployed into CENTCOM when General Hostage was the JFAC. And, and, and those WMDCs that are out there link very tightly with their JFACs and, and they are, their, their warfighting capability is, is really, really well. But when we bring it above the operational level and we start to take a global purview of it as, as Admiral Richard has right now, the unit of command starts to get a little shaky. And some of that is borne by UCP language that STRATCOM has as the coordinating authority, which doesn't really put too much teeth into one person being responsible for it. I, I don't want to speak for John Hill, but my guess is he'd probably be pretty happy to do one-stop shopping for a requirements person who, who is not just a coordinating <laughs> authority, but who is actually saying, yep, I'm the one driving, driving the requirements uh, chain. But that, that's really at the operational levels. And so I think, I think you know, when we take a look at, uh, at, at these COCOM reviews that are ongoing and we look at uh, uh, UCP uh, language, and again, this is borne out by the, uh, by, uh, 
the outcome of the MDR. I think we can get after fixing that. Over. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral Hill. Do you, would you like to comment on that? In MDA, of course, you're the chief architect, but also because of MDA's unique authorities, you do have a lot of flexibility to set requirements, and you've set up some uh, bodies to work with the warfighters in a systematic way where warfighter priorities are, are inputted, they are reviewed. Can you speak to that and how, how do you see the areas for improvement and working globally from your role as the chief architect and, and principal requirement setter? Again, uh, thank you. Um, I, hey, it's, it's, it's a tough game. Uh, someone said it earlier that, uh, you know, each combatant command has its own unique attributes. You know, so if you're, if you're defending CONUS, for example, there are some very unique attributes and there are some very unique threat vectors that, that are coming there that you maybe would not see out in the Pacific. Very unique out in the Pacific, big waters we've talked about, the big and blue. Um, so we have to account for the fact that you've got some differences. It would be great if we all had portable missile defense that we can just kind of go drop anywhere, you know, the kind of the way most people use that. But the, the reality is there are unique differences in threat, threat vector, capabilities, rogue nation versus near peer. So you have to account for that. Uh, but but I would say that uh, that Operational Forces Standing Committee um, is the key. It is it is our version of a JROC uh, for missile defense. It works its way up to all the key stakeholders and decision makers in the Missile Defense Executive Board. And I think that that process is absolutely critical. I've got some freedom to move some amount uh, of dollars over, let's say, to if I want to help kickstart a, uh, a site survey uh, to help uh, NORTHCOM, for example, that's something I can go do without having to ask a lot of permissions and go through big cycles. Uh, but to make big swings, to make investments in, um, you know, let's just say you pick a sensor, right? That requires a lot of work and coordination, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, it is taxpayer dollars, and so, you know, we, we get the oversight that we have. But I would tell you just about everything in my budget uh, is someone's number one priority. Uh, so when we uh, go through the hard knocks of uh, trying to find efficiencies or, um, you know, when there's uh, the need to take a budget cut, it is hard because I'm going to get somebody irritated with me. So the, the only way to come through that is to communicate, communicate often. And, uh, and the OFSC is that formalized way of doing it. Uh, the weekly conversations I have with Dan Carbler are very important to me. The engagements that my team are doing right now today uh, with NORAD NORTHCOM to, to see the art of the possible for the architectures for cruise missile defense, for example critically uh, important. Admiral Hill, just to, as a follow-on question, you talked about hypersonic missile defense. You also talked about the importance of cruise missile defense in addition to ballistic missile defense. But working across the unique requirements that you mentioned in the global combatant command structure, how do you, how do you see your role on hypersonic defense, cruise missile defense, in addition to the ballistic missile defense role? and and how do you, what's the best way, particularly as you get down to cruise missile defense, each of the combatant commands, whether you're NORTHCOM or Indo-PACOM, the discussion earlier on Guam defense comes into play. So where does MDA's role kind of begin and end? And where do the services have the role to do some of that work? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. Um, and it's probably what Ricky was kind of hinting at a little bit earlier when he started to get us riled up about um, you know, can't the layered homeland defense architecture and, and for Northern Command uh, be, you know, demonstrated, say, for defense of Guam? Um, I think one of the things that we can do to, to get a lot of lift across the way uh, is, is to work with the services. So, for example, I get very excited when we can find a, a capability, let's just pick the Navy, um, and we can deploy that very quickly by with some small evolution to it to maybe just take on a different uh, part of the threat set and then deploy that with the Army. Um, and how quickly you can do something like that. So I, I think it is, um, you know, if we're going to deal with the global uh, nature and the differences across them, uh, leveraging uh, existing capability gets you there quickly, constantly assessing what technology uh, pull and push you have to have for the really advanced threats downstream, coordinating with the services, so that at the end of the day, they're going to be operating them and making sure we're meeting those, uh, uh, those command and command needs. And, and John, I'm not sure if I answered the question of where you're going, but uh, that was my best whack at it. <laughs> okay, thank you. L let me go to uh, Indo-PACOM and ask Admiral Kohler about, you talked about the critical importance of uh, protecting Guam, both in order to allow for power projection from Guam. You uh, 
you've gone out to the services and, and MDA with a request for capabilities. Do you have a, a firm timeline on when you think a cruise missile defense gap filler will be coming your way or how, you, how do you plan to handle that type of cruise missile defense, particularly you know, the hardest ones are usually low altitude cruise missiles. Can you speak to that please? You guys got me? Um, so, uh, sir, thanks. Um, I, so, timelines, um, I think, are um, pretty tough. We're working with John very specifically within the fight up here um, to get after uh, this, closing this gap um, and doing that and trying to rely on um, existing capabilities that, that through John uh, Hill's help um, and overarchingly joint help writ large, um, integrating those things so that we can get after that gap. So the, the goal would be is I can work this within the uh, in the fight up. Um, the the current threat and reality is uh, is here and near, and uh, and so that's the opportunity to get after it so that um, uh, so we can uh, protect and fight for and from Guam. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. I can certainly talk a little more about it. I, I would I would pile on with. Uh, what Admiral Hill talked about um, on what what he can and is doing uh, in an effort to to get after uh, the threats that you mentioned and brought him, and it's all about the architecture and integration uh, thereof. And so, working with him and his team um, and getting all of these current capabilities to integrate to enable uh, sensor and shooter capability. Um, is uh, is really important and uh, and work in uh, specific requests um, for uh, the defense of Guam and Homeland Defense System Guam is what we continue to work through in the budget process and I'll stand by if there's any other comments. Well just the, the follow-up to that Admiral Kohler would be so the role for instance for MDA would things like development of THAAD which has been deployed in Guam or a TIPI-2 radar there's also um, the role if, if Aegis ships are deployed or there's been some discussion about potentially Aegis ashore being considered for Guam. But for cruise missile defense, then presumably the Army, uh, General Carbler talked about some of the capabilities that are being developed. They would, they would have the principal role for uh, putting in place low altitude uh, cruise missile defense. Where, where do you see, because this is part of the you know, the discussion we need to have to try to improve the way that we respond is where's the roles and responsibilities of the Army to surge to provide that and, and how does that integrate with what MDA is uh, developing and fielding? Well, sir, I think uh, we we continue to have um, through the through the GFM process um, the capability to get a level of um, uh, Patriot capability in Guam, those type things. I think uh, that in the in the short term helps fill some of those gaps. Um, but I think um, integrating um, ships, uh, which right now, as you as you say, we uh, we have them or have the capability to respond uh, in Guam. That fixes those particular uh, sites there, um, and then um, limits the maneuverability. And you have to make those risk decisions as you uh, as you move through uh, capability sets and uh, and threat um, timelines. Um, but I think there's some uh, some capability to to bring army systems uh, um, in and around Guam, in and around the first island chain um, to get after uh, to get after what you're saying. And uh, I defer certainly to General Carbler and. Uh, uh, and Admiral Hill, if there's something uh, I'm missing there. Oh. Understood. Uh, let me turn to NORTHCOM then. And uh, Major General Hook, cruise missile defense and uh, is something, of course, that NORTHCOM and General Shaughnessy has talked a fair amount about. You're also looking at uh, advanced systems being developed by Russia and China for hypersonic defense. And then you've got the important role for C2 and, and for executing defense of North America. Can you talk a little bit about what, what do you most need in order for NORTHCOM to fulfill its responsibilities to defend against operationally against all of those threats? What do you most need from the development community 
And what do you most need from your fellow combatant commanders that will allow you to do that? Because you don't just want to be the catcher's mitt where you're taking incoming from all of these systems. You want to be able to prosecute a defense with both active defense, but also uh, there are offensive capabilities that STRATCOM and others would employ. Can you speak to that a little bit, General Hook? Hey, sir, thank you. And uh, it just makes me smile because I sound like uh, everybody wants to give NORTHCOM and NARAD all the capabilities and I'll, we'll take everything uh, to be in there. But hey, let's, uh, let me highlight, you know, my favorite uh, device is the eraser to erase the lines between the combatant commands to, uh, uh, to bring us together to have the, uh, the, the overall discussion of it is the layered defense back here in the homeland. It's uh, as, uh, as Adam Michaela mentioned, the, the forward projection, whether it's the areas he's talking about in, uh, uh, in Guam as an example. But what I will say is the, the things we need in NORTHCOM and NORAD, uh, you know, all start with how we integrate the systems. You know, we look at the sensors out there and we need sensors that can continue to give us the battle space awareness and give the commander uh, decision space. And that's from, uh, from the launch all the way through the intercept and the ability to uh, track, and that's ballistic missiles, but also over the horizon sensing capabilities that are either forward-based or space-based or um, or what have you. And if you can take that situational awareness and bring that into the mission, I think you'll find that we're not gonna be reacting. We'll have decision space to uh, achieve a successful intercept. And then it's that command and control layer, as I mentioned earlier, that kind of glues everything together. So it really all starts with that sensing capability. And uh, as I heard uh, General Carpo talk about, you know, there's a keen focus on that to continue to look at requirements and develop them. Admiral Hill, you mentioned the same type of uh, forward looking because we don't want to be in a reactive state. We want to be able to, I would say, fight on, defend on our terms uh, from there. And it all comes with that battle space awareness. And then finally, uh, we've talked about a lot of systems and uh, NORTHCOM's perspective is and NORAD's perspective is uh, those, uh, those mechanisms that uh, enable a successful intercept, uh, you know, a GBI or a, uh, uh, some of the other systems that we talked about, continued advances in there. And again, the idea is to be transformational, think forward and continue to advance the capabilities that nest together because that serves all the combatant commands. And it's not just talking about, uh, you know, the homeland defense from the continental US or the, the NORTHCOM area of responsibility. Uh, you're good. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Hill, uh, as we were doing this uh, video conference here, of course, the, the news has continued. And one of the stories that has begun to be reported uh, on the wires is that Under Secretary of Defense Mike Griffin has resigned today, as, long, uh, as well as his deputy, Lisa Porter, effective July 10th. Uh, according to these news reports, uh, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Porter indicated they plan to uh, pursue a, a private sector opportunity that they've been approached about to do that together. Uh, uh, first of all, can you confirm that that's the case? And then secondly, that's of course your, your reporting chain. And if it is the case, who would be the acting that you would uh, report to? And, and what, did, what does that uh, mean in the very near term for MDA's uh, responsibilities? Uh, great, uh, thanks. Um, you know, I think I speak for uh, you know everyone uh, here on the net that partnered with me today. That if uh, uh, requirements uh, development and the development systems moved as fast as those sorts of announcements, uh, we'd be in a really great place. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Griffin and uh, Dr. Porter announced this morning during their staff meeting that they had submitted uh, their retirements and that they were going to be pursuing uh, you know uh, setting up a company someplace, which I think is what the news is uh, saying now. Uh, he followed up with an email and exactly the words that he put in the email I've, I've actually seen in the press. So to me, it's just fascinating how fast it moves. So yes, I can confirm that because uh, I did ask him if we could share that news and I have shared that news with my team. In terms of uh, who will uh, re you know replace him um, in an acting position uh, or who will be nominated, I, I don't know. Uh, not privy to that. And again, he just announced it this morning uh, during our staff meeting. So Mr. Rude, you continue to be really, really good. Um, I would tell you, in, in terms of uh, changes to the missile defense agency, I, I, I see uh, no uh, change. Uh, again, you know, I mentioned our mission earlier because because I love our mission: layer defense, protect the country, protect forward deployed forces and allies. Uh, that mission not, that mission has not changed in over a decade. Uh, I don't think that uh, anyone's going to come in and try to change it. 
but the one change that, that we did do over the course of the last couple of years, uh, really my predecessor, he just sent me a love note, so I'll mention it, uh, General Sam Greaves. Um, you know, we always debated whether or not that word ballistic uh, belonged in our mission statement. And then we thought about adding hypersonic and we thought about adding, you know, cruise missiles, but make sure we say strategic cruise missiles because we don't want to do the uh, the self-defense cruise missile work that a service does. Um, and, and so finally, we just took it off. And so now, now we just say missile defense. Uh, so I don't think that's going to change. And uh, and as we know more in terms of uh, who may be acting and who would come forward, I, I don't see big swings. Um, we again, my priorities and um, uh, requirements are set by Stratcom, who's consolidating across the combatant commands uh, in the services. Over. You can open up Very good. Questions. And then uh, let me just some of the questions we received, of <clears throat> course, from uh, folks in preparation for this session. Another thing that's in the news, and I'd like to ask Admiral Hill and uh, Indo PACOM Admiral Kohler to respond, is the Japanese government announced in the recent days that they were going to suspend pursuit of the Aegis Ashore system. Uh, can the two of you talk about what, what have you what have you heard from the government of Japan and, and where does that leave uh, the United States and what, what are you doing in cooperation with the Japanese and the fundamentals of that that the Japanese government and different officials there have commented they still face a large missile threat. Is there And so several of the questions were around the lines of uh, what happened? What does this mean for the future? What are we doing? Some get into the details of the contracts and so on, but they all could be summarized as what happened and what are we doing and what comes next? And so uh, Admiral Hill, would you please uh, start and then Admiral uh, Kohler, I'll turn to you next. Uh, yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, thank, thanks for the question. Um, I think if everyone was tracking the news, uh, it was announced uh, last week, uh, Minister of Defense uh, Kono uh, gave a public statement and made that uh, announcement uh, last Monday, uh, our time, hmm. uh, Sunday, their time, uh, well, Monday, our time, Sunday, their time, um, whatever, last week, early last week. Um, I will tell you that uh, Japan is a great partner, not only uh, with this nation, uh, but certainly with MDA. We have been doing lots of foreign military sales cooperative development with, the, with Japan. As you know, the SM3 uh, Block 2A um, is a cooperative development. I worked on that as a commander and as a captain uh, when I was down in the BMD. Um, so great partner. And I will tell you, like all uh, foreign military sales cases, you come through a number of decisions over time. And just to give you an example, for the last three years, you know, we started off with, you know, uh, looking at a lot of different missions uh, for Aegis Ashore. And then through lots of debate, we said, well, maybe IMD, you know, cruise missile, maybe hypersonic defense. Ah, okay, let's go with ballistic missile defense. Let's make it very similar to the European uh, capabilities. That was a major decision. It took a lot of time. There was a lot of emotion involved in that. And then there was a big decision on how much power and sensitivity you need in the radar. And lots of emotion, lots of craziness going out in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific over that decision. And we finally got there, made a decision, locked down the configuration. Um, so where are we? Where are we today? Um, the the radar contract is let. Uh, we're moving out with that. Uh, the dollars for the supporting part portions of the FMS case for that radar, you know, in the treasury are moving uh, forward. We're staying very close to Japan, but we want to give them that space. I want to honor the fact that they they queued me personally prior to making that announcement, and that means a lot to me. And so right now they're working at at the National Security Council level to make a decision on what they're going to do. And fundamentally, what the issue is is the sighting. Um, and those of you who have done uh, military construction uh, understand the sensitivities of local communities when you bring in a capability. We spent a lot of time going through impacts of the sensing capability, a lot of time on what it means to have interceptors near, near a community area. So I want to respect the government of Japan, give them that time, and I, I will commit uh, here on this station, I'm going to say the same thing uh, you know, to Commissioner Takeda tomorrow, which is, we are going to lean in and give you whatever support and help you need to make the decisions that, that you need to make, given the fact that we've made a number of them so far. So I'm, I'm not necessarily shocked. Uh, there, there are options out there and we'll work those uh, over. General Cole, uh, Admiral Kohler, rather. Yes, sir, Mr. Root. Thanks. Well, um, uh, to echo John's comment, um, they're, they're a huge partner here in the region and uh, we certainly uh, respect uh, their ability to um, work through their issues, as uh, as John mentioned on the siting uh, and all those type things for for us, and and working specifically with the uh, uh, with their uh, defense apparatus. You know, the threat um, 
hasn't changed, uh, and certainly from our perspective, um, and uh, and I think would ag- they, they would agree. Um, what we do have with them is a very strong uh, camaraderie. Uh, we have a very strong um, integration between our two militaries that work together in ballistic missile defense and all those things, and we'll continue to do that um, and continue to work for the best solution in the uh, in the theater for them, for us, for the overarching uh, threat that uh, that they and we face um, together. So I, I think there's uh, a whole lot of uh, continued work to do um, with the um, capabilities we have in common and uh, and we'll continue to uh, advocate for uh, for their um, their work here to uh, to get after this uh, this problem uh, that they uh, that they've um, uh, worked on. And so, sir, I, I just leave it. It's a, it's a phenomenal ally and we'll continue to work with them um, going forward. Thank you. Uh, let me turn back to Lieutenant General Carbler um, and ask uh, to shift gears here a little bit. Another one of the questions we got was around your role in Army air and missile defense. And it talks about the fact that the cross-functional team priorities were established for IBCS, MSHORAD, uh, IFPIC, LTAMS, and um, they said, based on your experience in being a, a senior Army Air and Missile Defense official, uh, where do you see the next big idea? Or what's going to be the next big focus area for Army uh, Missile Defense? And then, uh, of course, related to that, then was what, how will that how will they get pursued? Will that be just an Army program, or will it be? Uh, something done in a coordinated way with MDA, or how do you see that taking shape? Uh, General Carver? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I, I really think that we're going to have to be able to get after our, our hypersonic defenses, um, and we'll work uh, very closely with, with MDA on that, as well as with uh, uh, Space Command. Uh, again, we got to be able to sense it, got to be able to see it, got to attribute it, then we got to be able to intercept it. So, uh, uh, we, we really have to get after that. We we know it's a priority. We know that the adversary is out there developing. They're testing it, and and we've got to be able to defend ourselves. So so if if I were to pick one, that would probably that would that, be the one that's uh, right up front. I mean, in addition to everything that we have going on right now with LTAMs and IBCS and Ashorad and directed energy, but but really getting after uh, uh, hypersonic defense is uh, going to be critical for us. Over. Thanks. Um, thanks, John. Um, I'd just like to, there's one common uh, factor between PACOM and Indo-PACOM and John Hill, and that's the, the Hawaii radar. If you could just sort of comment on that uh, aspect of it, because I see it's in the, uh, the deterrence initiative fund and how that would benefit both of you uh, for that. And also, John, if you know that's a fight with HPTS and space, at, you know, how, how does that go with fixed sensor assets versus space assets when we need to get up in space as well. So you can start it. Uh, you can start it going if you want. Rick, Rick was that, that me? I was going to ask all three, yeah, but yes, go ahead. You can start. Whoever wants to start, feel free to chip in. Uh, I'll go ahead and give you the, uh, the technical side. Again, driven by requirements that trace right back to agreements between Indo-PACOM and, and NORTHCOM. Uh, sensor study done years ago that said in order to have full track custody from launch to intercept, this is where you need sensors. And uh, there were there were three of them. And uh, one of them is uh, coming to life in Alaska, it goes to low power uh, testing uh, this fall. Um, and so that one's tracking along. Uh, number two in that line uh, was uh, uh, for the defense of Hawaii. And given the geographic uh, situation, uh, in the, you know, where Hawaii is, there's not a lot of uh, sensing capability uh, to provide, you know, against the advanced threat. Uh, Hawaii defended today by the existing uh, sensor architecture. This was uh, for the future. The department made a really hard decision, you know, kind of back to, uh, you know, the trade. And uh, it's a shame that we have to do that, right? We have to make trades. And, and the, the primary uh, thing when everything uh, was voted on was that we needed to put our eggs towards a uh, higher investment on the space side. And so that was removed from the budget, but there was a study uh, that was done. So the, the radar was not canceled, it was postponed uh, pending a study. And that study has been delivered to the deputy uh, sec def and uh, we're standing by to, to execute uh, whatever that plan would be. Uh, over. 
Hey, sir. Uh, uh, so Webb here, uh, I, you know, I, I would comment a little bit on, on John's piece. And one is uh, as a lot of his trips come, have come out here uh, talking about Hawaii defense Guam, or, uh, radar uh, here. And um, he spent a lot of time meeting with uh, with all the local people here. And, um, you know, for us, um, it's about uh, the opportunity and the need here in Hawaii to, uh, you know, to see the threat, uh, to be able to discriminate it. You know, and then you got to shoot it, and uh, and we've got to we've got to look at that as a one forward uh, forward node of military structure, uh, and as one of the states and the defense thereof uh, of the homeland, and um, that's been the big push for us uh, to get enough power to be able to do that um, uh, with the appropriate architecture and the directions thereof to be able to see. Uh, see those pieces that they come across. And so um, short and sweet, but that's uh, that's where we are here in Hawaii. General Hyde, would you have a comment on it? <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, I like the way the, the sense is to the future as well. Decisions have been made uh, as long as they are executed well and we continue to improve the architecture overall and an advancement goes back to my uh, my idea of you know the defense of the homeland the global missile defense uh, uh, mindset as well and uh, and you know we would hope and continue to advocate for what the future would hold as we look at advancement and sensors um, we've talked about a lot of them already as well as the future design of how they're linked together so as Admiral Hill said you know there there have been decisions made we understand clearly where they are but what we definitely support from the Northcom perspective is how everything ties in to the overall construct for defense. And as we look at the different areas for defense, some are optimized uh, based, on the, based on the investment and we'll continue to uh, have great partnership and great discussions about what the next step is now for the future. So it's that advocacy again and what we will look like uh, to be integrated uh, better in the future. Thank you. Thanks. John, I think we have about five minutes or three minutes left to go. So I'd like to end up with some closing statements and I'd like to start with you, John, and we'll go around and then we'll we'll finish it up. But uh, I think we, we covered a lot of ground here. So John, uh, please uh, summarize as you as you best think. Well, first of all, it's been a pleasure listening to all of you and thank you all for, for participating. The way that missile defense has matured where the mission and you're listening to you talk about how you work with each other through various uh, councils, the MDEB, and different activities is, is heartening to see. It was also, I thought, uh, very nice to hear you talking about the importance of not just ballistic missile defense, but cruise missile defense and hypersonic defense, and then the enabling uh, role that command and control plays. And I think there's a lot more emphasis on that, as well as space uh, to enable these various activities. And so uh, I just wanted to say I appreciated hearing all that and and seeing the, the collaboration that's underway. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dan Carver. Dan, would you like uh, closing? Yeah, just just real quick, Ricky. Thanks again for bringing us all together. Always, always happy to be able to uh, talk missile defense uh, with you and with the team. And uh, if I just, uh, you know, one foot stomper leaving out of here is the importance of integration. Uh, through our planning and then uh, synchronize in our operations. And, and that's how we get through our, our missile defense fight. And you see it here within this VTC. And I, I really uh, am privileged to be able to see it from uh, from uh, the commands that, that I have. So thanks again for uh, having us on this afternoon. Thanks, Dan. Kevin? Thanks, Ricky. I know a lot of folks are watching and uh, they should see that there is a very clear resolve as we move into the future, uh, how serious we take this, how we man the watch, and uh, and there's no better place to be than, uh, than running uh, the future for missile defense because uh, we're well ahead and we'll continue to stay ahead as we look at the threat that's continuing to evolve. Still many areas to continue to explore, but it's this partnership, this teamwork that's really going to continue to take us to the future. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, Hey Ricky, thanks, and thanks to all the the teammates here on the uh, on the uh, VTC and to Mr. Rood for the questions. Um, you know, I would just leave with a couple things. One for us, it is about combat credible posture forward, uh, and that's due to the time that uh, that we're uh, uh, under as far as threats. And that's First Island Chain in Guam. They're forward and they're near the peer threat. 
And uh, and as it relates to time, I'll turn it back to you, Ricky. Uh, you know, I need to get. I can't bet on a first round draft pick later. It has to be in this fight up. I got to get after it. And uh, and the time's now to get over it. And I appreciate everybody's help doing it. So I'll uh, thanks for the opportunity today. Thank you, John. Yeah. Um, I first want to thank, uh, you know, the, the team here. It's, it's great uh, seeing uh, Webb Kaler again, Fumez again. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, really looking forward to, to getting closer with you. You know, and it doesn't get by me the fact that you've got the NORAD and North Comma balance uh, behind your head there. That, that's a huge responsibility, and uh, I'm glad you're in the chair, and I look forward to, to serving with you. Um, Dan Carver, a great, great friend, uh, didn't get past me that you've got the globe uh, behind you. So, uh, you know, I get the sense of the pressure uh, that you are feeling. Um, I, I will tell you that, you know, kind of back to, to all of you, again, uh, we work for you. And uh, if there are confusion and requirements, you know, let's go look where there's a commonality in it, you know, because we can find that technically, right? So so we, we kind of know there, there's a lot of goodness between 360 radars and a lot of different places, and we ought to go build off on that. And, and that's what I know our teams are trying to do. For us, we tie it all together with uh, command and control and battle management uh, and communications, our C2BMZ system. I, I just have to kind of throw one out there because that, that is the brains. That is how we're going to do layer defense. That's how the systems are going to talk to each other. That's our interface in the JAD C2. Um, so, so that's we have uh, technical architectures and we we have the, the larger architectures on how we're going to go do business. And so I'm looking forward to uh, serving with you. I, I want to just compliment uh, Mr. Rude's tie. You look awesome, sir. <laughs> and, uh, Ricky, thank you for being a great host and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks for everybody that listened in today. It's an important topic. Take care. Thanks. Thank, thank you, everyone. And just to, to end it a little bit, you know, great teams aren't made of first round picks. The majority of the team are not first round picks and you develop your first round picks over a period of time. And sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. And your key as a defensive group is to keep giving the ball to the offense, no matter what. You give it to the offense, no matter what they do with that ball, you got to keep giving it. And that is a deterrent. If you can do that and you have an effective offense, you deter everybody. So, you know, this is a team game. The co-coms are huge. You're leading it. You're all leading it. We got to play together. And we don't need to rely on first round picks. We get we gotta we gotta develop the other guys and ladies inside the team, and you gotta get them to trust you and play with you and and contribute to win. Because it's all about winning and it's all about setting the conditions to win. Because we've got a, a heck of an opponent that we have to be together to to beat and to compete against. We can't do it separately. So I thank you for your time, your your service, and leading the charge on the defensive side of the game. Thank you.